Hi, Harmony House. How's it going? We're going to continue reading chapter 12 of The Magic Misfits. So in the last chapter, Theo, Layla, Ridley, and Carter all went to B.B. Bazo's carnival, and they went to the show, at the grand finale show at the end of the carnival, and as they're walking back to Vernon's magic shop, they all discovered that something very special had been stolen from them. Theo had lost his the bow to his violin. Uh, Ridley had lost her notebook full of her magic tricks. Layla had lost her secret handcuffs. And Carter had lost the only thing he had left of his parents, which was this box. So um, they found instead a note in their pockets that said that they shouldn't have messed with the pock pickets. If you remember, Theo and Carter had stopped the pock pickets from stealing from a crowd of people during their show. And it said that Carter should have joined Bazo's crew. So because of this note, Layla and Ridley and Theo all found out that Carter had already met Bazo's crew. And so he had to tell them the truth. He, it was at a point where he couldn't continue these lies anymore. He had to be honest, especially with these people that he considers friends. So he told them that he had met with Bazo's crew and they had tried to convince him to join to join them and he said no and uh, that you know he's a runaway and he doesn't have a home and his uncle is not a good person who was trying to get him to steal as well so he finally let it all out was finally honest with them and how did they respond what do you think they understood they were a little uncertain at first they had to take in it was a lot of information to take in but they understood and ultimately they want to be Carter's friend and they want to help him and they want what's best for him. So they've made a plan. Well, they haven't made a plan yet, I guess, but they've decided that they're they're going to try to get their things back from B.B. Bazo's crew. And, um, and they're going to make a plan in the morning. So they're all going to bed, they're gonna get a good breakfast and they're gonna meet up to make a plan in the morning. And as Carter was headed back to his park bench, Theo invited him to come stay at his house. So that's where we left off. And here is chapter 12. Carter woke to the sound of music. A violin, he guessed, once he ordered, once he remembered where he was. He was stretched out in a bed with a real mattress, cotton sheets, a knitted blanket, and two pillows. His feet didn't even stick out at the end of the covers like they did with the newspapers that he and Uncle Sly had sometimes used for bedding. Sunlight glowed through the gauzy curtain. A gentle breeze fluttered in. This must be what heaven is like, Carter thought. A brief image flickered in his mind. A tiny bedroom in that red cottage with the white trim, morning sunlight streaming in, the sound of his parents' voices rising from the kitchen below. There was more, so much more, he wished he could remember. So he's thinking back to a memory of uh, when he was little with his parents. It's a happy memory, right? It was a very clean guest room. There was a full-size bed, a small shelf with fresh flowers in a vase, and an easel in the corner. The previous evening, Theo had mentioned that his mother was a painter. The walls were hung with pages clipped from magazines, sketches were hung with paper clip... Oh, sorry. The walls were hung with pages clipped from magazines, sketches, postcards, and photos of several stained glass windows. Carter stood and stretched. He hadn't worn pajamas in a long time, not since before he'd ended up with Uncle Sly. These were very comfy. A strange noise echoed up from the backyard. Peering out the window, Carter noticed what, Carter noticed what looked like a large wooden shed, its walls made of fresh wire. Blah, 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 sorry. <laughs> Peering out the window, Carter noticed what looked like a large wooden shed, its walls made of wire mesh. White feathers were scattered in the grass like a halo surrounding it. Breakfast, called a woman's sing-song voice. This had to be Theo's mother. Carter crept to the door and pressed his ear against it. Downstairs, the violin breathed out its final hopeful note. There was light clapping followed by a resonant voice saying, that was beautiful, son. Thank you, father. 
I'll go see if my guest is ready to eat. Footfalls ran up the stairs, followed by a soft knock on the door. May I come in? Of course, it's your house, Carter said. When Thea walked in, Carter asked, Do you ever not wear a tuxedo? Not unless I'm wearing pajamas, Theo answered. Anyway, just a reminder of last night when we got in. We told my parents you're a prospective student at Mineral Wells Academy and that the dean asked us to care for you during your visit. I remember, Carter reassured him. They decided to keep what happened with the pock pickets a secret. Theo's parents would only have wanted to alert the authorities. I'll be fine. I've been a lot... I've been in a lot tighter jams than this. I have to go out and feed the doves, but feel free to head downstairs whenever you're ready. So those are doves in the pen out back? They make for, they make for very interesting pets, Theo gave his signature nod. See you soon. There was a spare set of slippers for him to wear. The bathroom soaps were shaped like seashells. After Carter took a nice, long, warm shower, the best of his life. He headed downstairs. In the hall, the sky blue walls were decorated with Italian opera posters in white frames. There were other frames too, pictures of a very young Theo surrounded by four other kids who looked almost exactly like him. Siblings. Funny, Carter thought. Theo hadn't mentioned any of them. Academic awards and diplomas were mixed in with the artwork, each one containing a different name. They must have belonged to Theo's older brothers and sisters. When Carter padded down the stairs, he saw a trumpet hanging over the fireplace and a lamp-covered tower of books stacked neatly beside the leather sofa. Best of all, everything smelled clean. After years on the streets and in halfway houses, Carter wasn't used to things that smelled nice. Have a seat, Carter, Theo's mother offered gently. She placed a soft boiled egg before him in a little ceramic cup adorned with flowers that she had decorated herself. It was accompanied by a tiny silver spoon. Did you sleep okay? She was tall and her features were delicate. Carter could see where Theo had gotten his regal profile. She was dressed in a crisp white blouse and soft denim pants that were spattered with colorful paint. She wore her hair pulled back, tucked under a folded green paisley bandana. It was the best sleep I think I've ever had, Carter said truthfully. I am so pleased to hear that. With all my oldest children out of the house, it's nice to know that their rooms can be of use. When he went to dip into the egg with his spoon, Carter realized that it had turned itself into Carter realized that it had turned into a golf ball. Theo grinned mischievously. Theo, chided his mother, no magic at the table. You sound like Mr. Vernon, Theo noted before returning Carter's egg. My son tells me you will be staying in Mineral Wells for some time, Theo's father said. He had kind eyes and his black, and his black hair was flecked with gray. That's the plan. Well, I hope you like it here. I already do. Mineral Wells Academy is top-notch. Excellent music program. What instrument do you play? Theo's father asked. Not everybody plays an instrument, Theo said. He turned to Carter. My dad conducts the local symphony. He wishes the world was more musical than it is. Ah, son, that's where you're wrong, Theo's father said. The world is filled with more music than most people notice. He patted Carter's hand. Pick up an instrument. You won't regret it. On their way to Vernon's magic shop, Carter said, You know, I should be worried. But what you said last night is totally true. After a good night's sleep, a warm shower, and a square meal, I feel on top of the world. Like I could tackle anything. Even Bazo. Well, I'm glad you feel good, Theo said. But let's hope it doesn't come to that. The boys kept their eyes peeled in case any of Bazo's goons were prowling the streets. But as they turned onto Main Street, they found themselves stuck in a swarm of shoppers and sightseers. Who are all these people? Carter asked. Tourists, Theo explained. Warm weekends always attract the largest crowds. They stay at the resort and come down during the day to go shopping. 
Great, Carter said. There are a bunch of sitting ducks. Bozo and his crooked carnies are going to go and are going to go on a stealing spree tonight. You really don't like Bozo, do you? Theo asked. He reminds me of my uncle, only times a thousand. My uncle stole to eat, but Bozo just steals because he's greedy. We have to stop him and his goons. At that moment, something tickled the back of Carter's brain, like he was trying to remember something about Bozo's clowns. Theo interrupted, distracting Carter. Hmm, so he's trying to remember something about Bozo's clowns. What do you think he was trying to remember? Theo interrupted, distracting Carter. Perhaps we should just focus on getting our own stuff back first. Once we have that, we'll have proof to notify the authorities without getting you into trouble. Then we can help others, other victims safely. As the pair walked through mineral wells, Carter observed more of the quaint town. Of all the places he had been, mineral wells was uniquely beautiful. The firehouse's red engines gleamed in the open gauge. The barber shop had a red and white striped pole and friendly barbers who waved at passerby. The men and women working the counter at the ice cream parlor wore flimsy paper hats and made giant sundaes, and everyone in town had a smile on their face. It was perfection. When the boys walked into Mr. Vernon's shop, the parrot cried, Meow, meow, I'm a cat. That bird is hilarious, Carter said. Is she? Mr. Vernon asked with a kind smile. He appeared suddenly from behind the counter. Today, he wore another sharp black suit. Well, she's certainly smart. Most yellow-naped Amazon parrots are highly intelligent animals. They have the uncanny ability to mimic human speech and cadence perfect as door greeters. They can also deliver secret messages if properly trained. Is Layla awake, sir? Theo asked politely. I'm more than merely awake, Layla said from above. When Carter and Theo looked up, they found Lay Layla wrapped in chains and padlocks and hanging upside down from the nearly 20 foot ceiling. Someone start the stopwatch, she said. Mr. Vernon held up his pocket watch. With a click, he said, you may start. Layla began shaking and shivering and moving. Is that safe? Carter asked. An excellent question, Mr. Vernon said. Usually I would say no, but Layla is quite skilled. Though I suppose as her father, I should make her wear a helmet. He pulled a small notebook from his jacket and jotted down the word helmet before tucking it away. The tiny bell on the door jingled as Ridley wheeled in. Hello, hello, how are you today? Presto the parrot asked. Hey, Presto. Ridley reached up and scratched the parrot's yellow neck. Morning, Mr. V. Good morning to you as well, Ms. Larson. 30 seconds, Layla. I'm trying to get my time under a minute, Layla said, struggling. One chain and the lock fell free. But it's hard without my lucky lock picks. You lost your lucky lock picks? Vernon asked. She didn't lose them, Theo answered. They were stolen. By Bazo's goons last night at the carnival, Ridley added. I didn't want to worry you, Dad, Layla went on. Are you sure it was them? Vernon asked. Positive, Theo said. He put the Pock Pickett's note on the counter for Vernon to read. They robbed each of us of a prized item and left us a note. They called you misfits? Well, that's rude, Mr. Vernon said. And stealing is a filthy habit, like chewing gum. I think stealing is worse than chewing gum, Dad, Layla said. Another chain and padlock slunk off and hit the floor. She still had one more chain and padlock. 60 seconds, sweetie, Vernon said to Layla. Ah, pickles, she moaned. Well, I'm sorry to hear that the carnival workers stole your things, but things can be replaced. They weren't carnies, said Ridley. They were a barbershop quartet. Even worse, Mr. Vernon cried out. Actually, they took something from me that can't be replaced, Carter said. It's one of a kind, really, and it means a lot to me. My bow didn't hold true sentimental value, but I would like it back, Theo said. It's hard to make things levitate without it. 
And my journal has months of great ideas in it. Ridley flexed her fists. I'd rather bust some skulls than start over. Well, I don't think it should come to fisticuffs, Mr. Vernon said. Perhaps there's a more subtle solution. We know they're staying at the Grand Oak Resort, Layla said, swinging around like a fish caught on a line. If we find what room they're in, perhaps we could sneak in and get our stuff back, and no one would be any wiser. That's not a half bad idea, Mr. Vernon said. If a small group were to sneak in, it might be better to have two teams, one keeping an eye on the villains and another to make the grab. Hypothetically speaking, of course, I don't condone such behavior at all. Vernon gave Carter a wink. The last padlock unlocked and the final chain fell to the floor. Layla reached up, uncuffed her ankles, and then flipped to the floor like a graceful acrobat. What was my final time? One minute, 42 seconds, Mr. Vernon said. Quite good for losing your lucky lockpicks. But not great, Layla said. I need them back. You know, I recall the other Mr. Vernon mentioning that he had to feed those insufferable clowns again at lunchtime. That might be an opportune moment to search their rooms, Mr. Vernon said. I suppose if you accidentally wandered into the wrong room, it would be an accident and not illegal. Something to keep in mind, in case. Mr. Vernon, are you suggesting that we... Theo started. Mr. Vernon quickly cut him off. Absolutely not. I would never. Only a group of absolute misfits would think up such an outrageous scheme. He crossed the room and knocked a box off the shelf. Several wigs, hats, and glasses fell out. Oops, I'm such a klutz. Layla, would you and your friends mind picking these up? Feel free to borrow any of them if you like. I often find changing one's look to be an advantage in awkward situations. Carter, Layla, Theo, and Ridley, the misfits that they were, looked at one another with mischievous smiles. So that is the end of chapter 12. So it sounds like they're starting to formulate a plan. So to recap our chapter, first of all, um, Theo was able to let Carter stay with him, but they didn't tell Theo's parents the truth about Carter because they don't want Theo's parents to call the authorities and have Carter sent back to his family. Do you think that's a good idea or do you think they should have just told Theo's parents the truth? And then after that, they headed to Mr. Vernon's magic shop where Mr. Vernon found out that all of their prized possessions had been stolen. Uh, and he said, oh, well, I don't condone such behavior as to steal your things back. But while he was saying those things, he kind of uh, gave them some little hints of how he could help them or ideas for what they could do. He reminded them that, first of all, the other Mr. Vernon uh, works at the Grand Oak Resort, which is where Bazo's crew is staying. He's a chef there. So he kind of hinted that maybe they could use that to, to their advantage. And he also accidentally knocked down a box of hats and glasses and things that they could use for disguises. Um, do you think they're gonna use them? Do you think that's a good idea? Should they disguise themselves? What would you do in this situation if all your things had been stolen? What do you think that the characters could do to get their things back? Do you have any predictions? What do you think? Well, um, before we end this video, I just wanted to do a quick read on chapter 13 because uh, the author kind of did something silly for chapter 13. I'll show you here. This is it. This is all that chapter 13 is. It's got a big X across the top. So let's read it and see what the author has to say. You'll notice this book has no 13th chapter. As you probably already know, 13 is a very unlucky number. While I don't believe in luck, I do believe in magic. And, as I have mentioned before, magic comes in all shapes and sizes, and occasionally it comes in the form of bad magic, such as tripping over your feet, falling downstairs, or making a poor grade on an important test because you genuinely forgot to study. Okay, I suppose I do believe in bad luck. But that's besides the point. As most buildings do not have a 13th floor, I am choosing not to have a 13th chapter. 
Instead, I am going to allow you to use this time to take a much needed bathroom break. Go on then, I'll wait. Done already? That was quick. I hope you washed your hands because you are about to use them to turn pages faster than ever. So that's it. That's chapter 13. So the author left us a little note in chapter 13 saying that he's actually going to skip chapter 13 because he says it is an unlucky number. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll continue reading chapter 14. All right, sounds good. I will see you then. Bye.